So on behalf of the Red Fuel Congregation, we'd like to enjoy our discussion with our uh, circuit overseer. His talk is entitled, Walk in the Way of Integrity. So let's give our attention to Brother Guy Pell. Integrity and trust, similar, almost synonymous words. So we talk about integrity, that's a word that's not often used by people today, but the word trust is. So who can you trust? Who has integrity that you can trust them? Is it the politicians? Oh my, there's a discussion. Is it uh, the commercial people, the business people? Well, how about employees and employers? Employees can't trust the employers anymore. That They don't know about job security or promises that were made. Retirees that uh, thought they had certain benefits and then they just pull the rug out. But it seems that the people at the top, as they say, are always protected. And then, of course, uh, there's uh, employers who say they cannot trust employees. Thefts and other problems and sabotages and issues. And then, of course, uh, we come around to... Uh, whether or not uh, wives can trust husbands, can husbands trust wives, can children trust their parents, can parents trust their children, grandchildren, grandchildren trust their uh, grandparents, as seen by some cases that get a lot of publicity, such as in Florida. So all kinds of issues come along, do they not? And then, as they used to say, well, you can take that to the bank. Well, now the banks, my what's happening there, the financial institutions that uh, are in so much trouble. And uh, topped off, it seems recently, by allegedly uh, the greatest uh, uh, single scandal uh, scheme, as they say, in uh, history so far, and they're still trying to work that out and see where it goes and if there's guilty parties and so forth, because we're not in a position to judge that. But already lives have been lost because of that situation. So all kinds of situations that we deal with. Who can you trust? So it's a matter of integrity. Integrity is something that uh, people like to have. Uh, ha know people that have integrity to be able to uh, speak about that, yes. But when it comes to integrity, are they willing to be a person of integrity themselves? Uh, well, we find that often that's only up to a certain point. Now, integrity carries a, quite a connotation to it. There's a lot involved with integrity. It's moral soundness of mind. There's an issue of uh, regarding uh, how we're going to be viewed by other people and how God himself will view us. So integrity is critical for us in these days that we're living in. And so what we'd uh, like you to do is take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. And let's notice what's presented for us there. Now, our Bible teachers may be aware that Psalm 119 is the longest chapter or division in the Bible, has 176 verses, and every one of those verses, except for two, happens to be number 90 and 122, but every one of those verses in eight different ways, or one of the eight different ways, makes reference to the law, the reminder, the order, the commandment, the judicial decision, the regulation, the saying, or the word of God. And so it's composed of 176 verses, 22 alphabetic stanzas of, uh, eight, uh, of verses, eight verses each. But what we want is verses 1, 2, and 3. And they all make reference, of course, to that law, that integrity of God. So verses 1, 2, and 3, happy are the ones faultless in their way, the ones walking in the law of Jehovah. Happy are those observing his commandments and those who, his reminders, with all the heart, they keep searching for him. Really, they have practiced no unrighteousness. And with all the heart, they keep searching him. In his ways, they have walked. So here, Jehovah wants people to be like that, and that his servants who are like that indeed have a rich reward in the approval of God when it comes to these various issues. 
Now, Jesus expressed this point of integrity and putting things to the forefront in terms of our worship and our love of God in the right way to begin with. Now, for example, we can uh, take our Bibles and turn to what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 22. And we invite you to turn there if you would like to. Matthew chapter 22. Here, Jesus, in uh, teaching, shows that uh, integrity involves a way of life that would involve an unswerving set of standards. And in fact, the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to get him turned around, the scribes, the Pharisees, all of the others. And they're always looking to get what they call today gotchas, and uh, to embarrass him and to discredit him. Well, that was because they had their own agenda of trying to keep their own self-serving system going and to keep themselves in position. So moral soundness of mind or completeness of heart devotion to God is what is applied here to all aspects of human conduct. And so integrity involves a way of life that reflects unswerving devotion to righteousness. Notice how all of this uh, heart motivation, the heart motivation is entailed in what Jesus set up in chapter 22, verse 34. To begin with, it says, after the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they came together in one group. Say, oh, they were going to take care of this. The Sadducees couldn't do it. And one of them, versed in the law, asked, testing him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. He said to him, You must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind. So that would entail, it would embrace this concept of moral completeness, soundness of mind, being together, being grouped together in this kind of a manner, uh, bringing all these qualities to bear so that a person would be one of integrity toward their devotion to God. Now, Bible teachers among us may be familiar with the fact that the soul is the living person. But the soul, as a living person, by definition, has to include a brain that's working somehow to send signals to the person, to make them alive, and then in addition, it has to entail also a heart, pumping the blood and so forth. But Jesus said the soul, the mind, and the heart That almost sounds redundant, does it not? But think of it this way. Let's ask a silly rhetorical question. Where are you right now? Where is your soul at this moment? Silly question. Well, I'm at the Kingdom Hall. First Street Avenue, Redfield, Iowa, Dallas County, United States of America. North American continent, Western Hemisphere, planet Earth, Milky Way galaxy, solar system, all of that. But where is our mind? Is our mind at the big game? Is our mind uh, uh, at Walmart? Did our heart just take a jet trip to Hawaii? Kind of interesting to see how Jesus was able to embrace all of that into the commandment to love Jehovah with all of that. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have minds that uh, do all these different things and what have you. That's not a condemnation. However, it does show, see, the completeness of our love and our worship toward God. And that's what he was conveying. And, of course, uh, this silence, these uh, various uh, uh, religious leaders who were trying to test and to trap Jesus. So integrity does indeed involve a lot, and it's a challenge today. We are surrounded by a world with low moral standards. It comes at us from every direction. It comes through copper wires. It comes through fiber optics. It comes through tubes. It comes through broadband, narrow band, squeeze band. You name it. It's all there. It comes through to us uh, through the airwaves. It comes on tapes and discs of all different kinds and sizes and shapes and uh, various uh, memory uh, capacities. It comes at us from the printed page, and it's even beamed from outer space via satellite. You name it, it's at us. It's in our face, as they say all the time. So we have to keep our guard up. We have to be careful. We have to be selective. And Satan indeed is the god of this system of things. He uses persecution, opposition, worldly influences, satanic tendencies to get humans to leave the way of integrity. 
And indeed, the world is designed, because it's Satan's system, to display, to promote, to entice a system that does not build integrity. And that's why we've got all this mess that's going on. So, but despite the influence of the satanic world around us, we can walk in the way of integrity. That brings us to Psalm 26. We invite you to turn there. Psalm 26. And let's uh, consider some of these verses, actually all of them. You leave your mark or ribbon here if you so desire. And we'll notice some of the examination that David, who is the author of this psalm, brings to bear that maybe we can learn from. That's why it's in the Bible, so that we can benefit from this. So Psalm 26, consider verse number 1. Judge me, O Jehovah, for I myself have walked in my own integrity. And in Jehovah I have trusted that I may not wobble. So King David wanted to be and was a man of integrity. Now, that's despite the fact that he obviously had problems. He had difficulties. He was not perfect. His problems, his shortcomings are well documented in Scripture, and they indeed were very, very serious. However, he saw the problems brought to his attention. He was willing to make changes, to make adjustments, and indeed he really did love God. And that was acknowledged. And he was willing to be judged by God. So he said, judge me, O Jehovah. So he wasn't being judgmental to himself, but indicating that he wanted to put himself in God's hands. But now verse number two takes it another step that maybe we can learn from. He says, examine me, O Jehovah, and put me to the test. Refine my kidneys and my heart. He wanted a heart exam. Now, this wasn't an electrocardiogram, a CAT scan, an MRI. See, this wasn't that stress test and being metered and monitored, but rather it was one regarding his qualities, the standards, his motives is what he wanted examined by God. It was a personal issue. Of course, it's written in the Scripture uh, under inspiration for our benefit. So do we regularly invite Jehovah to examine our heart and our heart motivations. Now that would be indeed uh, quite a, a thing to do, but that's what we're encouraged to do by virtue of scriptures of this nature. Do we let Jehovah examine who we are and what we are? Not just an artery check, so to speak, but uh, just simply here to the kind of person we are. So David invited that, he wanted that, and integrity-keeping Christians indeed would welcome such an examination, prayerfully relying on God to refine them. And you see it says in the verse, refine my kidneys and my heart. So it was kidneys also. Now our Bible teachers may be familiar with uh, the fact of uh, Jeremiah 17.10 saying about Jehovah examining the heart and even the kidneys. That's cross-referenced in our New World Translation Reference Bible to Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 20, where the kidneys are mentioned. It's footnoted there as a reference point is that the kidneys representing the innermost emotions. They're buried deep within the person, and it also is a refining organ, removing the toxins and the waste. So we learn from that. Do we want Jehovah to do that for us? That's a personal issue. You don't come along and say to somebody, okay, I'm ready for my exam, or check me out. That's between us and Jehovah, because he's the only one that can effectively and properly do that. Verse number 3 then shows that he tried to take this and do something with it. He said, for your loving kindness is in front of my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. So he kept it before him, so he'd go in the right direction, but then he walked in the truth. Now, even in the world that we live in, the Western world, there's a little phrase, not just to talk the talk, but walk the walk, as they say. So he put it into action. Actions speak louder than words, is the phrase we're familiar with. Because they reflect and reveal the innermost motions. They reflect who we are, what we are. They reveal what is in the heart, and they reveal what is not in the heart, is what our actions do. 
So David was willing to go through that to be a person of integrity. So David, in order to do that, kept God's acts of loving kindness in front of his eyes. Now how can we walk in God's truth unless we know Jehovah well and indeed have knowledge of his word? So the taking in of knowledge, you've got to have that in front of you. Be aware of certain things, know the issues, and be able to identify them, to deal with them, and to therefore be protected as a result. Same thing with all the other things that we do in life for our physical health, our emotional health, and so therefore for our spiritual health. Now, David walking in the truth also meant that there were places he would not go. He kept God's loving kindness in front of him, but that meant therefore he wouldn't be sidetracked to other negative issues. Or even in the world, sometimes they use an expression such as negative association. Let's look, if you would, here in verse number 5, 4. I have not sat with men of untruth, and with those who hide what they are, I do not come in. Now 5. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and with the wicked ones I do not sit. So the question is, do we associate with people of untruth, of moral lack of standards who do not have integrity by virtue of our other associations. Sometimes this could be who we are entertained by, who we go with and are identified with, the kind of activities that we may be involved in. And then this can also be reflected by who we invite even into our own homes. Now, not necessarily through the front door or the back door, but maybe through those cables, those airwaves, those discs, who we bring in in that wet manner. So we have to be careful of our association, that we're uh, not being entertained, one, in the wrong way, or by people who have other agendas and issues, who are looking to undermine us, just to start to put in seeds of doubt in order to lead us in the wrong direction. So we're careful about who we associate with. Now, sad to say, some have made adjustments and have done very well in the past, but then later on, by not keeping their guard up, their integrity becomes cracked, it becomes violated in some cases, and we find ourselves in a bad situation. So we have to be careful of who we're being with in one way or another. Some may hide what they are by pretending friendship with us. Oh, you people are good people. Oh, you're so different than everyone else. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, it takes courage, and I respect that, for you to live the way you do, for the stands that you take, for doing your ministry, for being this way or for being that way. And, uh, of course, that makes us feel good when people compliment us. That's nice. But on the other hand, are they looking then to then later on do something? It's like somebody who wants to get your money. Now, most of us are taught at a very early stage to be careful of some people. They're just out to get your money. Oh, they can sweet talk, they can be persuasive, they can appeal to everything and anything. Your own greed, your own need to be helpful to other people and so forth. And then once they've got the money, they're gone. And you can't get it back. Schemes and scandals all the time along these lines. And probably almost every one of us have been victimized in some shape, manner, or form over the course of our lives, some in little ways, some in much bigger ways, sometimes being disastrous. So the same thing here regarding being careful of people who are trying to undermine our faith, get us to let our hair down, relax a little bit, and before we know it, we're sucked into this whirlpool which only goes down into a cesspool. And apostates indeed hide their motive to draw us away from Jehovah. So it's very critical that we keep our guard up to guard against bad association. Now, David was careful of what he kept in front of him. He was careful of not going off in other directions. And he did something else too. Verse number 6. He says, I shall wash my hands in innocency itself, and I will march around your altar, O Jehovah. He took action. 
He marched around the altar, God's altar, by exercising faith in Jesus' sacrifice. He exercised faith in Jesus' ransom sacrifice. So that meant that it meant something to him. It was critical. He would be at the kingdom hall. He'd be at the arrangements for meeting. He would do so on a regular basis. He would march around the altar by virtue of his worship in terms of his ministry and other things, the active participation, helping others in the congregation, exercising Christian qualities, the caring and concern for other people by virtue of all the things that Jesus set the example in. So therefore, our devotion would become acceptable to him. And then there was a further work that he did in verse 7, to cause thanksgiving to be heard around aloud and to declare all your wonderful works. So David pointed to a work that helps us, should we not feel the same way about the privilege of sharing with others what we know about Jehovah. So this is informally as well as in our public ministry, going out in the service, door to door, all the other activities that we do, might be telephone and letter witnessing and our other activities that we do, but we're out there making a statement by virtue of our putting forth that effort. The angels see it, Jehovah sees it, Jesus sees it, but so does Satan and the demons and his uh, uh, ones that are under his control, and we are standing up for true worship. So causing thanksgiving to be heard, declaring Jehovah's wonderful works, and how pleased Jehovah is with that. We zealously pray in the preaching work we are protected from conforming to the world. Those who are busy and active in the ministry will always tell you that the ministry serves as a protection. They're always talking about it. It's coming out from underneath them, from within them, and being challenged. For example... Well, why do you this and why do you that? See, always being ready to make a defense for the hope within us. And having a, a Bible-based principle for what we do and for what we don't do. And then being able to deal with, as we say in our part of the world, all the yeah buts and so what's. What's the point? What's the point? That's what people like to know about in Iowa and elsewhere. What's the point? Get to the point. What's the bottom line? And so you can give them a Bible principle or law, or statement, and then it becomes, uh uh-oh, now I've got a situation, now how do I defend this? In essence, that's what happens in a person's mind, and it becomes, yeah, but. Well, we learn to deal with those yeah, buts, do we not? We can declare these things, declaring Jehovah's wonderful work, stick to the issue, stick to the principle, and that empowers us, makes us feel good. Well, Jesus did not say, except for the children. Aren't we supposed to lean on Jesus? All the other things that we can come... We stick to the issue. We understand the principle. Being people of faith, we see it. We can make the shoe fit. And that's by virtue of the other things we already talked about, being here in the Christian congregation, having the interchange, and why we encourage brothers and sisters and others. We go back and forth and, yeah, buts, and so what? And this person said this and so forth. And that was a different angle. I hadn't heard that one before. And uh, this is what we said, another way of doing that. So we're declaring God's works. We're building up our faith. It serves as a protection. It arms us. It prepares us. It reassures us having these Bible principles and laws. And that is something pleasing to God And that's the blessing that comes from that. Another step that helps us to fortify our integrity is, of course, as mentioned, being here so that we can have the interchange. Verse number 8, he says, Jehovah, I have loved the dwelling of your house and the place of the residing of your glory. So association at all of our meetings, assemblies, and conventions helps us to continue in the way of integrity. And as we attend the Christian meetings, we make a diligent effort to take in knowledge, to benefit from it. What did we get out of the meeting today? Now, hopefully, if somebody would ask us that at the end of the day, at this point, we can say, well, we had a very good discussion about integrity, what it is, what it is not, how Bible characters were people of integrity, such as David and Jesus. We have things that we can go back to. We focused on Psalm 26, other verses and things even that Jesus said. 
And that's just in the first portion of our meeting. We've benefited from it. And you talk to other people, perhaps even on a Sunday like this, as many of us will be uh, doing a little bit later on, is that we come along and they say, oh, I've been to church already. Oh, that's interesting. What did you learn today? Well, I'm busy. Or I've had enough. Or the singing was good. Or they really got into it. The Christmas spirit. The drums were great. All kinds of things of that. What did you learn about Jesus today? Oh, my. See, we've got things that we can share specifically. Now, some people are interested. Most are not. But Jehovah has asked us to go out and to help people. But we benefit as a result. We've come away. We've learned something. What did we get out of the meeting tonight or today or our assemblies or our conventions? And we can talk about that. And we've benefited. We've been upgraded. And we can pull this up from within us. Now it's a part of us. Now we're a person of integrity. It's not just shallow when we came and we were entertained and it was very nice and it was very comfortable and it was nice to be with some of the friends, which all of that is good and should be. But are we being built up? Are we being uh, educated? Are we being enhanced by virtue of being here, as even David had expressed here? So he wanted to be at that place of God's glory, dwelling in his house, in fact, David wanted to build the temple. He was not permitted to, but he gathered all the material. He did everything he could to be a part of the arrangement of worship. Much as what we've been doing here in our own kingdom hall, having a repaired damage and wanting to be here and being involved in all of the various activities, trying to help out as much as we can, as many in the tens of thousands of congregations around the world indeed are doing. So what a wonderful privilege we have to be with other people of integrity and to share these things. Now, not wanting to lose his life along with other sinners, David pleaded for Jehovah's mercy in verses 9 and 10. He said, Do not take away my soul along with sinners, nor my life along with blood guilty men, in whose hands there is loose conduct and whose right hand is full of bribery. So he wanted to make sure he kept his distance from them, but he also realized that this was a life and death issue. This was critical. This wasn't just simply, uh, well, develop some good habits, like uh, not eating too many potato chips or something of that nature, or making sure we get uh, proper rest and uh, nutrients and exercise. No, <laughs> this was a, a definitive life and death issue, and he recognized it as such. And so he pleaded for God's mercy. And that's something that we do not want to take for granted. And so when it was all said and done, we have to ask ourselves, are we a person of integrity? Do we give God glory by continuing to walk in integrity? So verses 11 and 12 sum this up very nicely. He says, As for me in my integrity, I shall walk. O oh, redeem me and show me favor. My own foot will certainly stand on a level place among the congregated throngs. I shall bless Jehovah. So may our manner of life show that we respect, we appreciate, have raised in value the sovereignty of Jehovah God in our life. Yes, his right to rule, to tell us what to do, what not, not to do. And never allow Satan to entice you into a situation that could jeopardize your precious relationship with Jehovah. Yes, indeed, let our way of life reflect the wonderful words of the verses in Psalm 26, especially 11 and 12, as we continue to walk in the way of integrity. Thank you very much, Brother Guy Pell. We think of uh, walking in integrity. We learned a little bit more about it this morning, so we look forward to that.